Welcome back to We Should Be Working. I'm Zach Hendricks, and with me is uh, Jeff Finley. Jeff and I were just sitting, chatting about, hey, where do we go from here on the episodes? Where are we at? How do we finish? And uh, we realized that we were recording an episode um, as we were chatting it through. So we wanted to uh, stop that conversation, get back in here uh, with everybody. It's good to see you again. Good to have you back. And um, we want to pick up a little bit with, you know, last time we were talking about uh, Jeff was in Austin. We did talk a little bit about uh, astral projection, uh, how we got there. But th this road trip and this journey of life uh, that I'm kind of fascinated with as far as how do we get from one point to another? Um, and I think Jeff has such a unique and interesting story in all of this. So Jeff, within Austin, let's talk a little bit about where we were before as far as you're in Austin. Um, you're having these cuddle party experiences. What is the what is the moment or the events that are leading you to decide like eh, Austin isn't for me, and that you that you end up leaving Austin? Okay, so good question. Yeah, and and in our in our chats before this episode or before the recording, I mean, we were there's we realized that there's like so much we could talk about, so much so so many different stories within Austin and leading up to it that we just don't have time to go into. And some of that stuff is probably meant to remain private, um, but we can give you the Cliff's Notes version of it. All right, so we talked about the cuddle, um, the cuddle parties, the sex parties, the orgasmic meditation uh, events that I went to, um, and realizing it was kind of like a cult and stuff. But I like to break down my Austin experience into like four seasons, right? Okay, and without getting into too much detail with each of those seasons, let me say like I first moved there, in the, the winter. And so I got, got my feet met in, into the community. I met some people through some of the friends that I had uh, established on my road trip prior to moving there. And they introduced me and I met a girl at one of these parties and she kind of uh, introduced me to the the hippie scene, the new age, spiritual hippie Austinites, ecstatic dance, um, you know, South by Southwest at these, at these life parties. It's like meditation, uh, you know, healing, dancing all sorts of new age stuff um so anyway i got kind of got in with her and we started seeing each other and then uh we our relationship lasted about three months um and then uh i i did the cuddle stuff after that um so through that i got in i got my you know through the empath group through the authentic relating games group i met the people there we did the cuddle party we did the sex party and then um through that night this is where the, the thread i'm going to pick up on so because we're in these groups, these these facilitating groups for empaths and uh, to people to connect and do cuddling events and workshops, we were like, I want to do a workshop of my own. So we started this idea called the Cuddle Tribe. And we're like, if we, we're going to host our own events and see if this works and um, maybe we can make money on it. Maybe it can become a thing. Anyway, we hosted a free event at my apartment. And like, you know, basically we just invited some of our friends over that were part of these groups. They came over. It was a good experience. Everyone's kind of laying around. We, you know, we decorated the place. We had a big like mattress, like a futon mattress. We, you know, and I'm, I'm a... curious how you decorate for a for a cuddle party. Oh, you know, with 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 uh, hippie tapestries and incense, yes. and you know, it's very much a new agey hippie experience. Okay, um, right, perfect. And everybody there is obsessed with consent, obsessed with talking about their feelings, about being radically honest, because this this community is tangential to the nonviolent communication workshops to uh personal growth stuff so anybody that's into self-development uh, higher awareness spirituality these kind of people can get together and these are the people that attend an event like this so we did that and then through this we're like gosh i think we can charge for this let's create a real event and we charge for we'll sell tickets to it so me and my partner we we started planning it and then eventually so we'll, we'll we designed business cards and everything like that and we're handing them out to people we're going to do this thing for real um we had a meeting that like the day before the event was supposed to go on and both of us are kind of getting this sinking feeling that we don't want to do it. And we're like, shit, we've already promoted it. There's already people who've, who've marked themselves attending and they paid us. Um, but I think because we were in this space of learning how to trust our feelings and being radically honest, we're like, what's the most honest truth that we can say about this that we don't want to do it. So let's cancel it. And we're like, that seems really scary, but I think that's what we should do. Let's go. Let's do that. Let's cancel it. What was so, the what was the fear or what I, I shouldn't say fear, what was the reason that you think was like I, I don't feel like doing this? Was it the interaction with the people? Just like I, I don't feel like 
strong in this anymore. I feel like I already had my experience here. I don't have anything new to offer. What what was it that made you not want to do it? That's a good question. So it's been a while. I'm trying to think back. And I think the, the predominant feeling was we don't want to be selling this. And uh, yeah, and we also don't want to be like in business to do this. Like we're not really in it for the long haul, I don't think. And and we just kind of got a general feeling of no that we couldn't really explain. And I think part of it too is the sense of obligation to other people. Now that like once we put an event on the books and start it and make it become a thing and no longer felt organic, it felt kind of like this thing that we're doing for other people. And now we're trapped by it. Like it's just like, oh my God, another burden that we got to do. You know, um, we didn't want to do it. It, it. it eliminated like this sense of lightness and freedom now. So we canceled it. We felt free. We're like, we're not doing this. Let the people that are running these cuddle events, let them do it. There seem to be the ones that are excited about it. We'll just go to theirs. Like, we don't need to do it. Uh, we felt so much better at that. Um, this is around the same time that I started working at Starbucks. So we've talked about this before, but yeah. I had a stint at Starbucks for about three weeks. I thought that this is what I meant to be doing to try to get a job to support myself. Um, freelance work was low, all that kind of stuff. But like I said before, they stopped putting me on the schedule, even though they told me they were fast tracking me to their supervisor position. That's how they saw me. That's what they wanted me to do. But because I wasn't being put on the schedule, nobody was communicating to me. And even if I, I tried to ask, I never got a reply. So I just stopped going. I'm like, you know what? Fuck it. I don't want to do this either. So I'm like, I don't want to, I really don't want to do this at all. And so it's like, okay, another message from the universe. Like, I think that I need to do this thing and it's not working out. So, okay, I guess we're not doing that. So then, well, and I think oh. uh, it, it's interesting not to derail the story too much, but for people listening, it, it does mm -hmm. speak to a lot when we first started talking as well, like in a creator economy, like there's a lot of practices and you and I have talked about this as well, as far as what are we happy? Like, how do we profit off of this without feeling dirty? And I think that's a lot of creators or in the economy, you want to go into business for yourself and there is that thought of like, I, I don't even like doing this part of it, but I think people are expecting it. I, I, I can't do that. Or I don't want to charge for this. This doesn't feel right. This doesn't feel good profiteering off of, uh, you know, the week or something like that, however you want to put it. Or you're doing this tedious work because it's expected of you, even though you don't like doing it. Um, and then same with the Starbucks thing. It's like, you know, oh, I guess I should go get a job. I should do all this. We're going to fast track you. And then you're like, I don't even like doing this anyway. What am I doing here? But then trying to have that realization, then like, well, that's the job. And then, so then what am I going to do that? Yeah, that's a struggle for everybody, you know, in a lot of different ways, whether you have a full-time job or your creator is what are you okay with? Um, that yeah. I think that's fascinating part of, of all that's okay. So that's good. So so decide not to to continue with the cuddle tribe. Now, okay. So if I'm not doing Starbucks, what can I do? I know. I'll become a professional cuddler. Yeah. <laughs> so we weren't going to do the cuddling events, okay? But uh, that, uh, there was okay, this yeah. there was this uh, company called Cuddlist at the time that uh, was offering certification and training for people who wanted to do professional cuddling, and I'm like, I can do that. Shit, like I. I I'm I'm into this. Like this, there's a lot about it that speaks to me, and I can show up for people and just be present for for 30 minutes or 60 minutes, and kind of hold a, a unconditionally loving space for somebody. And and like I appreciate I appreciate that, and I can do this. So I started taking the certification courses. Okay, now I got up to 99, percent and I decided that I, I I lost the motivation to do it. I lost the inspiration. It wasn't there anymore. I said no. This isn't what I want to do. And this was after I had done a few test sessions with people like um, some of my friends. I said, hey, I'll give you a free cuddle session and we'll do it. We have to practice like the framework and the structure and what you're supposed to say and how you're supposed to run it. Um, and then also I had to cuddle both men and women. So that was a little awkward for me, but it wasn't it wasn't a sexual thing. So it was like I got to I had to do a test session with a professional cuddlist who was a who was a man. And I got to experience what it was like to be cuddled by him so this i mean it kind of sounds weird i mean i no wonder my dad thought it was it was weird okay like i don't, yeah, I don't, I don't blame him but but in this experience it felt safe and real and authentic and um not, not weird at all so i'm i'm in this position and it's like i basically tell him what i what i want i'm like i just just want to be kind of in your presence and kind of sit there next like let's sit next to each other let's just hang out maybe like you can give me a bear hug or something like that and it was like 
for that moment, it was interesting because I've never been physically intimate with a male figure really ever in my life, except for maybe when I was a baby, if my dad would hold me or something like that. But it's like male to male contact is like forbidden. And I'm not, in, I'm not looking for male to male contact, but like, you know, something about like relaxing into a hug that, that somebody that cares about you, it was like an unconditional sort of fatherly presence that was like safe and loving and warm and not, doesn't have an agenda. They're not trying to get in your pants or try to do anything weird. It's, it was just simple. And I was like, it felt really good. Like it felt safe. I felt comfortable. And I was like, okay, nothing, nothing funny happened. There wasn't any grooming going on. See, now that's my perception that this is what, what happens. But, but then but, again, yeah. that, that reminds me again, exactly of fight club. Uh, there's the times, if you remember when he goes to, to the support groups, all the men would get together, they would pair up, they would embrace each other, and they would cry or talk about the uh, the pain in their life. And that was mm. ultimately what finally brought him peace of mind that he could start getting sleep was when Bob embraced him and let him cry and let it out. So it makes yeah. perfect sense uh, that I yeah. I think you're absolutely right. Every every male understands, but at the same time, to your point, it sounds very, very odd to have somebody actually do that. Or to yeah. bring that up that no guys but like or you know women I guess I could, you could just say people that it's like what do you mean you're gonna have some guy just come hug you and uh, it seems weird and odd but at the same time there's something there's very much something there yeah I mean people go to massage therapists and get massaged by male massage therapists all the time you know um, or have a, a doctor give you the hernia test and you know kind of go down there <laughs> I mean there's situations where we're that are that are, in, you know, kind of awkward, but we, we do, do them. them. They're socially acceptable. But for Trips. whatever reason, like just some platonic holding and cuddling and like actual heartfelt intimacy is like, whoa, that's just weird. So to do it in a structured container, that's why it was safe. That's why it was there. It was like sanctioned. And that's the whole point of doing it in a structured container. So anyway, I, I had my certification. I was almost there and I just decided to not follow through on, on the end of it because I just felt like I was already getting the inkling to move on past this, that this was a stage. And I'll tell you the final boss at that stage. Now we've talked about this before. We talked about it before the recording. Okay. So um, I had a friend. She was in our group of, of for authentic relating games in the empath group. She had met somebody at one of the cuddle parties and um, they were trying, they were getting into a relationship. They were dating um, and she was having issues with uh, the sex aspect and that he didn't really know what to do. He was awkward. He felt unsure. And through our conversations and through our relationship, she said, Jeff, would you uh, be interested in being like a, a sex coach for, for us? And I said, oh, well, not nah, dang it. There's a, there's a job for me. Yeah. <laughs> and she's like, I'll pay you. And I was like, you'll pay me. Yeah. Okay. Okay. What, what, what do you need? She's like, I just need somebody to kind of show him how to touch me. And, and I said, well, I'll, I, you know, you got the man for the job. I, I'll sign sign me up. <laughs> did you did you feel confident or intimidated by that? That maybe you were fraud or more like I got this. I know a hundred percent what I'm doing. Well, the, the, there's a lot of steps that led me to this this location, this right. spot here. Okay, so two years before that, I had a soul retrieval session with Kelly Lachey. Um, I don't think she does it anymore. I don't even know who she is or where she is anymore. But she did this amazing session on me and. Um, she also, we talked about, I was getting a divorce and I was looking out to date and everything. She recommended, uh, this instruction guide about like the female orgasm, how to, how to like touch and pleasure women. And I really inter was really interested in it. And that's so why I like studied it and I practiced it and I thought about it. Um, so sexual healing, sexual health, sexual well being, um, consent, all of this kind of stuff was appealing to me at the time and my own sexual healing. So I wanted to ex learn how to express myself, but also express like respect and truth and like safety for, for, for the women involved and for all parties. So the, I was already interested in this stuff. I was already starting to see myself as a sex therapist or sexual healer, sexual coach. Something about it was appealing to me. And I think that I had met that sex worker at the orgasmic meditation event. And she told me a lot about stuff. She was a massage therapist and an escort and, and, a, and a pornographer. She was into all of, all of that stuff, but not with men. It was like a feminist pornography uh, uh, gal. She was into all that. Um, so we had all these long talks about this. And um, so it just kind of naturally led me to this position where this woman, who was a good friend of mine, she felt safe. And she's like, I trust you. You have integrity. This is why I want to ask you. You're not going to do anything funny. 
Like you're not, you don't have an agenda. You actually care. Your, your, your heart is open and it's like, it's safe. And so that's what appealed to me. And I was like, this is the chance for me to show up and kind of do my divine service. That's how I felt. And so I did, I showed up. Um, we set up the room, you know, we had, a, you know, our, with the, the blankets and the pillows, it's like we're doing a cuddle session and we talked about our feelings. Everyone got to express their honesty and their truth. You know, the, the man felt present and comfortable with me there and she felt comfortable. And so we just, I won't go into detail what we did, but I mean, yeah. you know, we did what, what was on the, on the contract basically. And, uh, everybody was happy about it. They, and then the, 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 the two folks got to hang out and I said, all right, well, my job here is done. I'm going to leave. You guys do whatever you want to do now. And so like when I left, they gave me a check for a hundred dollars. And then the funny thing is, is the guy gave me his, his like high school or college graduation cap. And he said, here, this is like my gift to you for, for doing this. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> like what? And so like I put on this graduation cap and then I, I have this check of a hundred dollars in my hand and I'm like saying goodbye to them. And they're like, overjoyed they're having a great time out to your car yeah i'm walking out to my car and i'm like fuck i was like i made it i graduated i did i did the thing i like all of this work that i've done up to here it's like i've paid off i've learned the lesson and now i'm graduating after that i was like the the sort of dream to become a sexual healer like sort of started to fade into the background it was no longer on the top of my mind um i did the thing that i was supposed to do i don't know so that leads me up to the next phase. But before I go into that, do you have any response or comments? No, no, I think that that makes sense because it sounds like the reaction then is, you know, I, I think that there's multiple things in life where it's like, as soon as you do it, you're like, I didn't need to do that 50 million times, but the fact that I did it feels like a sense of accomplishment. And maybe there are other people that do it over and over and over and over where somebody is like, oh, I need to go run a marathon. They went and they did it. They might never run another marathon again and be like, hey, that's all I needed to do was run that marathon. Maybe I thought I'd like to do more, but now that I did that one, that, that's enough for me. But at least I can say mm -hmm. that I did it. Like People aren't trying to make a career out of climbing Everest. Now, have people done it multiple times? Sure, but they're not making a career out of it. Usually it's like, I just need to do it. This is not like in some ways, like I, I, I've got to keep doing this or do all that. So it sounds like it was kind of that experience that maybe you thought that it would go one way, but then as soon as you did it, you're like, you know what? No, I did that. That was a phase of my life. And now I'm done. Is that kind of how that was? Yeah, it, it was. And um, there was also this voice that was kind of like, why are you doing so much to help women? What are you doing to help yourself? And uh, okay. And so I'm like, you know, I realized I'm like, so, so much of my life leading up to this point, and even still today is kind of like this inner, inner being that wants to be, to wants to understand and, and heal women, heal the feminine aspect of reality of, of God or something like that. And so here I am in a situation where I'm also trying to find my own sexuality and like my own expression, feeling, not feeling ashamed of being a man. I think growing up in our culture, I've, it's, it's, I had this uh, messaging that was very much like second wave feminism, you know, where female empowerment and men are, are supposed to respect women. And so I kind of grew into this role as being a, a caretaker or a nice listening ear or a person that really wanted to care and understand. And I think women were gravitating towards me and I, I spent a lot of time around them. They respected me and appreciated my, my opinion and my safety. But if I would ever try to pursue a sexual relationship, they would be like, oh, no, I don't see you that way. And then I would end up going home feeling like I'd just been rejected or hurt. And so this is a situation where I had my own interest, selfish interest to kind of like do the sexual healing and get to like, you know, touch this woman and be with her. But I was right. like, OK, that's there. I'm aware of that, you know, and it's not like I have to turn that off. She 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 right. knew it. She expressed it. But. So it's not, so I, I felt that, but after these events, I'm like, why am I doing so much to, to help and heal women? Like if, if the genders were reversed and a woman was trying to spend all of her time trying to heal men, like something's off there. So, and I think this is characteristic of my entire arc, my entire road trip, my entire uh, time in Europe, which we can get to it's, and I was like dating and chasing women. I've been, I'm recently divorced. So I'm kind of like want to be in relationship i want to have sexual ex experiences with women but i don't want to have like a one night stand or a hookup because i didn't think that was healthy and i didn't believe in it um it wasn't for me so if i was going to have a, a hookup it needed to be like fully conscious like here's exactly what we're doing there's no games being played so then 
there was a friend of mine, um, that sex worker who we ended up like in a situation where we, where like there was some sexual tension between us, but it was like, it, it made her freeze up and like her trauma and her past was being triggered. And like my perception of myself as like a predator or something was being triggered. So it's like, it was, it was triggering both of our traumas and we both realized we had to go our separate ways. But she told me, maybe you need to find a fling or somebody that's like somebody to play with that is on your level, that is interested in the same things you are, you know? And I was like, yeah, okay, well, we'll see about that. I ended up meeting somebody a couple of weeks or a month later, and um, it was just that. So this was more about like, what do I want? What is like, what do I feel forbidden that I'm not allowed to express about the things that I desire? And so like, I got to tap into some of this stuff and some of it involved going, doing some like BDSM dominant submissive dynamics and uh, practicing some of the stuff um, that I didn't feel was safe for me to do. But like when I had a woman that was basically into it, I was like, oh, this can be fun. This can be safe. This isn't some weird thing that I'm into. So I got to play around with it and experiment. And um, that was the final chapter of my Austin experience. Um, now, the funny thing is about that relationship is that she was married and she was cheating on her husband with me. And here I am in the opposite role. Now I'm the sort of affair partner where I was in my marriage and I was being cheated on myself. So sure. I, that's a different, that was a different experience, but she told me, she's like, we're getting a divorce anyway. We're already kind of separating. Um, she had kids with him. That's why she's with him. But like he knows, or he doesn't care, or that's, that was the excuse that she was telling me, but like, I don't know sure. if that's really true. But anyway, we had a fun, like little three months that three or four months. And I was like, but by the end of it, I told her, I'm not going to be here in Austin. I'm going to be leaving Austin. There's no relationship here. This is the only thing that's what we're doing. I try to be really above board and really set the framework for what we're doing. And she agreed to it. And I mean, it was tough to separate, tough to part ways, you know, because anytime you do stuff like that, you get close to somebody. But we knew that it wasn't going to be a lasting thing. So it's yeah. kind of like a little fantasy bubble, you know, not real, yeah. not real world. But we, we did our work together that we were supposed to do. And it kind of like helped like both of us. from life. Yeah. Yeah. It helped both of us work through some stuff that we were working through. Um, anyway, so that was the end of the phase where I started to feel like, well, actually it wasn't actually to the, the end of the phase that didn't really occur until I got to Europe, but we could talk about that. Why I decided to leave Austin and go to Europe. Yeah. Cause so did you go, were you still technically living in Austin when you decided to go to Europe or did mm -hmm. you move as well? So you're, but did you know at that time too, that you were going to move away from Austin? So was it like, look, I'm getting out of Austin. So before I go, I'm going to go on this trip to Europe or I, I'm in Austin. I don't know where my place is. I don't know where to go. I'm going to go find this new experience in Europe. And then after Europe, you decide I'm, I'm going to leave Austin. Well, I had um, met somebody that was like, she sent me an email off my website after reading my Starseed article. I wrote an article about being a Starseed like one questioning if I was, you know, the whole idea of it being a star. Seat. So she's like, I need a job. I just moved to Austin. Do you need an assistant? And like, I really love your writing. I love what you're doing. And I was like, all right, well, let's meet. And so we met, she was like 10 years younger than me. She had the same birthday as me, which was interesting. So we felt like it was a synchronicity while we're meeting. Um, same birthday, same year, same birthday, but 10 years, 10 years, uh, 10 years. Oh yeah. 10 yeah. Years you younger. Said years. Yep. Um, but she's also a Gemini and she was also into the stars. You concept. She was like, she was like very mystical, very like this, like, a uh, very intelligent. Um, but anyway, we get, we get together. We start talking about the job, like how, what, what does she want to do? What can I afford to hire for? What do I need help with? So we start laying this out and things start to get a little funny. Like she starts to realize that she doesn't want a job. She doesn't want an assistant. She just like, she was seeking for seeking something within herself through this job. And, and in this conversation, I don't know what it is. It's like, she, she started to be more interested and in intro introspective. And she started crying when we were together. She realized that she was missing something and that me just being there and kind of listening and holding the space for her helped her realize that what she was seeking wasn't the thing she was going to, wasn't really what she was after. So she says, I don't think I'm actually meant to be, I don't want a job basically like, but I think I was meant to meet you in this particular way. So anyway, we go on, I go on with the rest of my life in Austin. We say goodbye and we occasionally exchange emails or texts. It wasn't until that, that fall, um, we started talking about 
digital nomad lifestyle, traveling, you know, the sort of van life experience. Um, I was starting to get attracted to traveling abroad, traveling around the country again. And she had been somebody who lives more or less a digital nomad lifestyle. She was in Austin for like three weeks or something like that before she moved. She, she was, so she had been staying across the country, like traveling by herself and living in all these places. And I was like, how do you do it? She's like, well, you can do it too if you want. Here's how I do it. And um, so she was like a, a, an inspiration or, yeah. or a guide. Somebody who basically says, if you want to go to Europe, like you can do it. Like, don't be scared. Like, here's what I did. I, you can use this website. You can use this. So she like showed me exactly what I need to do to try to like get over there. And the last thing that I needed to kind of get myself over the hump was, uh, well, there was a girl over there in Germany that I had been a fan of online that I was like curious about. She had read my book, Make or Mistake Her, and she posted a big thing on Instagram about how it like really changed her life and it really moved her. It felt like her soul was speaking to her. Um, and I'm like, dang, there's a synchronistic connection. Like, I got to go hang out with her. I got to go see her. And I was still a little bit girl crazy, you know, like I um, so attracted. And I was uh, I'm like, you know, what? I'm going to let that be the, my starting point for going to Europe. Since I don't know anything about that entire continent, I don't know where to go, but she lives there and I'm going to start, I'm going to go, that's where my, I'm going to start. So I, I said, I'm going to get my plane tickets and I booked my ticket to Berlin. And then that was how I got over the fear of going to Europe. And then once I got there, I would figure it out basically. How, how long did you stay there for then? Uh, three did months. You pass around? Wow. Three months. What? Yeah. So because I am fascinated. I had a cousin that kind of did this, would come back for work for maybe like three to six months, get enough money for a plane ticket, and then would go back to Europe, and then you'll see her when you see her type mm -hmm. of a thing. Just like, who knows when when she'll come back. Um, she's just going to bounce around and figure that out. And I was always blown away at – it's not that she made it sound easy, because I know it's not easy to just show up and do that. But the savvy to know that she felt very confident the entire time that she was like, yeah, it's going to be fine. I'll figure it out this way and do all that. And mm -hmm. while I'm a person that I love problem solving, I teach problem solving above, uh, above almost every, everything else that I think is something that um, – whole other topic. But I was like, I don't think schools really teach that should be taught. Um, especially if you want to talk about professionally, a lot of times most jobs are mostly just like – hey, I'm giving you a problem and I need you to solve it. It doesn't matter what the problem is. People that are good at that and people that are generalists. And honestly, I would say somebody like you um, or even like me where it's like, I, I don't necessarily consider myself good at this, but if you give it to me, I'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. And that's how I developed as an artist and developed all this. And so I was always so jealous of her that I was like, it's weird that I hold that in such high regard, but she can do that so easily and just be like, yeah, I'm going to go stay in a hostel and here's how you find the hostels. And then you meet these people. And now I'm working at this vineyard with this family staying in the, this guest house. And I do that for a little bit of time. And then, then I say, no, I'm kind of done here. I had a fun experience and move, move off because I met this person. I, that was so it's still in a lot of ways. So crazy mm -hmm. to me. Um, that you have to be open to new experiences. So can you talk a little bit about how you made that work? Was there anything significant in there or how did you make your trip to Europe work without us turning it into a uh, travel show per se of, uh, how to, uh, how to travel Europe, but no, look, that had to be intimidating. Yeah. I mean, it was intimidating, but because I felt like I had this like push, you know, this like guidance, you know, the universe was supporting me. Um, uh -huh. it made it a lot easier. So. I did. I got over to Europe. I just had my backpack, right? And that girl that I went there to see, well, okay, first, I got super sick when I first got there. Like the first oh, really? day, I got like sick. So basically, I was in bed in my Airbnb for the first few days. I didn't even get to go explore for like three or three days after. But I'm, just lying, I'm laying in there in bed, like I'm throwing up, you know, I'm, I'm just awful. It's just gross. And um, it's like I'm adjusting. <laughs> my body is adjusting to the new environment. Um, uh -huh. So I'm texting with this girl and we're trying to figure out a time to meet. And she keeps like playing with me. Like, uh, she's not meeting. She keeps canceling. She keeps being flaky and I'm getting frustrated. Now, eventually I realized that she's not going to meet now. I'm going to have to go figure out something else to do. And there was a Facebook group for star seeds. And I met a couple of people in that group that were in Germany. I posted anybody here in Germany, you know, and I said where I was and I had a people, a couple people reply and I was like, Oh, do you want to go grab a coffee or something? And she's like, all right, cool. So I went and hung out with her. Um, 
Now, this was a cool, this was cool. This, she was like an alien, man. She was like from out of this world. We had some interesting conversations. This wasn't romantic at all, but it was like, she mm -hmm. helped me. She's been living in Berlin for, I don't know, for three months for school. And she's like, here's how you get on the bus. Where's she from? She's, she was from uh, like Hong Kong. Oh, okay. Gotcha. So she had been, you know, studying there. Uh, I think she was from Hong Kong, but um, she told me how to get on the bus, how to get on the train, how to buy a ticket. Like, how, you know, so I'm like, thank goodness for somebody like you. She like took me to the train station, showed me exactly what buttons to push on this thing that I couldn't understand, you know, and I'm like what? trying to, trying to like get my bearings. And she was there to help me get my bearings. No, but in Google the meantime, we had, that. yeah. what's that? No Google Translate uh, like we have today. So, No, no, not necessarily, but it's also very English friendly there. It's just, you know, these things I don't do. There's no public travel, that, public transport in Ohio that I, I do, you know. So sure. it's different in Europe. So I learned how to do it. She teaches me a little bit. And then she's like, well, you're on your own now. But, after you know, so a few days we had, we hung out and then she we went our separate ways. But she told me some crazy stories about how she had, like, done ayahuasca, like, nine times. She was only, like, 22 years old. She's Jeez. already done ayahuasca nine times. She she had just crazy stories of astral projection and and having a hybrid children. She um ha has children in other dimensions with aliens that she communicates regularly with at night and through her astral travels. Oh jeez. Um. So and she had in one of her ayahuasca experiences, she felt like she was the embodiment of pure evil uh, itself. That and doesn't it was, sound good. And it was the most terrifying experience. Yeah. But here we are that, in this like a, coffee shop in Germany. Yeah. We're talking about it. I'm like, holy uh -huh. shit. Like, how did I meet you? Oh my God. So I was fascinated by it, you know, as if I, as, as I am, you know? So anyway, she taught me and I, I went on my way and the next destination was meeting another girl, uh, somebody who I felt I had a crush on. She had this angelic vibe. Um, I kind of wanted, I was just curious. I was like, I need to go see you now. Let's hang out. Now, this is where this is, this is like the end point here where it, it, it's the universe has communicated to me to stop chasing girls. This is not what I'm here for, here for. Um, we're, we're in our bedroom at the end of the night or whatever, after we've been hanging out all day, going to castles and, you know, having lunch and dinner and stuff. And I'm not getting the a sexual, sexual romantic vibe from her at all. She seems almost too innocent. She's like, she's a 25 year old girl. Uh, I was like 30 years old at 32 years old at the time. She's like got paintings of herself off stuff on the wall of like Disney characters. She's like into very much this like fairy tale Disney perspective. And she had an angelic vibe of her that felt like very innocent. She also talked about her obsession with Michael Jackson. And I said, wow, that's just, I don't know, something about Neverland, you know, this like child, like Peter Pan yeah. feeling. Yeah. That's what I was getting from her. But so anyway, she was not interested in any romantic connection at all. So like I would, I was feeling this like craving that I needed something and she picked up on it. She said, I think what you are really looking for is yourself. And, and I was like, no, but I'm really looking for you, but I know it's not yeah. you because if it wasn't you, it would be her and it would be her. It'd be that fairy girl down the way that I'm like looking from afar. It's like, what, you know, what am I so obsessed with? So it was after that. I had this like reality check and I said, I need some help. I, I felt like I had a sex addiction or, or some sort of addiction to women or some obsession with getting their approval, getting their, like getting their love. I don't know what it was, but I just want to reach out to um, a coach online, like a healer, uh, somebody who is well-versed in um, sexual healing. And I contacted her and she kind of helped give me this, she gave me this practice that she called Jin Shin, which is a, an actual like meditation technique where you hold pressure points on your body and you hold them for like 10, you know, a minute or, or two minutes. And then you go to the next one, you go to the next one. And she said, if you, if I did that every, every day for like 10 minutes and just went through this process of holding my hand on these different points, it would reset my nervous system. And with that intention of like resetting myself back to my default settings or something like that. Sure. And so I said, okay. So I started doing that. I started noticing immediately like energetic shifts in my body where I would start to yawn. And I would start to feel like movement energetically, like emotions would start to come up and I would start to cry about things. And I'm like, whoa, 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 what am I doing here? That's like making me cry. It's making emotions come up. And I, so after, at that point, I said, the rest of the trip isn't going to be about girls. I'm swearing it off. Basically, I'm going to just focus on myself now. And, 
and doing this practice. So I still traveled around and I was taking photographs of beautiful nature. I was going to see waterfalls and mountains, castles in, in, in Europe, fascinating, beautiful stuff. But I would be getting triggered a lot. And, and I had a technique that I would use to process my triggers instead of analysis and and reading more books or self-help books or trying to meditate and re do spiritual meditation stuff to kind of get myself out of the pain or out of the trigger. But now this was actually a body focused process that like did something in my body that helped me release these emotions and I would feel better afterwards. And that's when I started doing this yawning technique. I would notice that when I would yawn, it's like this surge of like a uh, breath that would come in and I would exhale and it would be this like feeling of relief. And after enough of those, I started to feel like whatever that was, that was really activated within me was like gone. And so, that's how I started to process and deal with the pain and the feelings and the fears and the rejections and all of this. I was using this technique and I, w I eventually learned to, I didn't need the, the, the Jin Shin aspect of it. I started to develop my own technique, which I didn't need that. So I still use that to this day and it's become like a pillar of my spiritual practice. Um, yeah. Sure. So how much of that, when you're, when you're in that state of mind and I'm, I'm sure that it was, up and down and you know it was never necessarily constant but how was your struggle with that meaning was there times when it was like i feel like i'm obsessed and this is not healthy and i can't stop um how how deep did it get or was it one of those where was it did you feel like you were fighting yourself a lot of the time or was it just more like a song stuck in your head that it was like, ah, eh, it's just this kind of a nuisance and I need to get this song stuck in my head. So if I can find a good routine when I do these things, it gets me away. Or were you kind of like, I don't know, I don't want to sound like I'm not trying to oversell it, but were you kind of like worried about yourself type of a thing? Like this, this is not good. I don't, I don't feel like I'm, I'm, I'm myself at all. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, it was very tough. Um, but because I felt like I had the, like a, a like a strong kind of spiritual presence that was with me that was showing me this it's almost like i felt like there was i had a, a friend within me wherever i went that was like it was really me it was like my higher self and me starting to begin this relationship together like my lower earthly ego self, ego self and like the the bigger expanded higher self that had the perspective and the unconditional love for me it was me learning how to trust that and learning how to to you know yeah, come back, come into this to to experience this. I don't, I don't know. So I and, had that. Uh, and in how long after your divorce was this the Germany stuff? 2017 was the Germany stuff, and the divorce was 2014, 2015. Do you think that there was still a lot of just left over as far as like I'm still on this journey path of recovery, healing, and we're you know I haven't had a. I don't know. I don't want to put it that way, but maybe I've had these kind of, um, yeah, I guess another, uh, I was thinking of another fight, fight club reference or <laughs> single serving relationships is what he would say. Um, um, I've had a bunch of these kind of single serving relationships trying to figure out where I'm at. And then was Germany kind of at the end of maybe some of this, like, uh, this divorce recovery where you're finally figuring out who you are that, you know, this tension is not necessarily like I'm fighting myself. I'm not a good person or something. It's not, it's not that it's more like mm -hmm. discovering of who I am. Um, and I'm trying to discover who I am. And the, was it kind of that, do you think? Oh yes, absolutely. That. And realizing kind of coming out of denial of the betrayal I experienced and sort of the sure. expectations, like my own, my whole entire first half of my life building up to something that is like gone now. You know, like I don't have the job. I don't have the, the marriage anymore. I'm like a completely free spirit, like roaming around the planet now. I'm like, what am I doing? But I was searching finding for myself yeah, searching for I like now? who I really was outside of the guy who works at Go Media or that's a designer or this whatever. And outside of the, my role as a husband or, yeah. you know, that. Uh, and so and also just coming to terms with the, the reality of the betrayal and how that really hurts. So I started to. And I would still follow my attraction. The things that I were interested in would start to change, you know? And I was very much starting to come into my own and, like, respect my own masculinity, my own manhood. Stop, stop feeling ashamed of being a man. Like, stop chasing after women to try to get a woman to approve of me. I need to be my own best friend. 
there's a book I read in Germany called Iron John. It's a very popular, historically popular from like the the 80s and the 90s for men. It's a, it's like a men coming of age, um, mythical, poetic, kind of uh, mystic, warrior, king, lover, magician, like Joseph Campbell, archetypal story about like male redemption and like how men we feel this pressure to do something and perform and kind of develop an identity for ourselves because we don't really have one outside of outside of like what we do or what we build or whatever or what we can provide but they talk about like the keys to your true self or towards like this maturation process is like stealing the key out from your mother's pillow is how they describe it and like she's not going to give you the key like because that doesn't really give you the lesson that you need to learn to, for your own independence you have to want it bad enough where you go get it from her and you assert your boundary of like, I'm a separate individual from you now, mother. Like it's when, it's when a boy turns into a man by like leaving the womb officially, like he grows up, he develops the desire to assert himself as an individual human, as an, as an individual man apart from a woman. And so he does that and he takes, he takes the key back. And now he's not looking for his identity in women or trying to fulfill his like mother need on all sorts of different women, you know, which I realized sure. I was doing a lot of that. Sure. Um, so that was really inspiring to me. And I started to get into books about masculinity, get into books about men. And it felt very taboo at the time because I was coming from a feminist liberal perspective where men are denigrated, you know, or, or if you were a good man, you're basically just a man that agrees with all the things that they say. And you're a safe man that doesn't, it's not a threat to anybody, but this kind of inspired me to start looking into it. And then when I start looking into literature and material that's made for men, then you start getting into like the manosphere or the, the red pill is what they called it. Gotcha. Um, have you heard of any of that stuff? It's like fight club. That's a huge example. It's like when men yeah. feel disenfranchised and they're look, they don't feel like they've got a place anymore. They find each other and they kind of radicalize each other in some way. Like we don't need women, like men going totally. their own way or, or, yeah, or me tell is what they call it. It's almost like uh, it reminds me of, of uh, some of that stuff. Like, I think that there is a very good, healthy way to go about it, which is obviously what we're getting at eventually here. But it is one of those where I think just as human beings in general, we have a tendency to swing from one pendulum side to the other. One pendulum side? What am I talking about? Like no, swing right. like a pendulum from yes. one side to another, where you might be way over here and be like, wait, this isn't quite right for me. But then you almost swing a little bit too far the other way and you can have these radical, radicalized masculine groups. And that's kind of what Fight Club talked about, an extreme mm -hmm. nature of some of that, that now you're blowing up buildings and all this as, uh, as far as coming next <laughs> again. But yeah, you can tend yeah. to swing that other side of these masculine groups. Yeah. Yeah. So this could be called my red pill era. Okay. Now, after I left Austin, was 2016, Trump had just gotten elected. And I... At that time, I was not political at all. I wasn't interested in politics. I mean, I think I voted for John Kerry in 2004. Like, I didn't really care. I, I, I knew that the left and the right were kind of like facades and the people were always fighting and then, you know, they didn't agree with each other. And I was like, why can't we all just get along? You know, I was, I believe I was more of a centrist. Um, but anyway, like the summer of 2015 or the summer of 20, yeah, summer of 2016, the, I started to become aware of a lot of the polarization and the division that was happening online with liberals and democrats and and conservative republicans you know like watching the trump supporters fight the hillary supporters and just the, the the social justice activists against like you know cis hetero white men you know just watching this uh crescendo into like this gigantic toxic thing but i was finding myself refreshingly interested in the right wing point of view and that was very scary to me because everybody i associated with prior to that was all left wing and that's how I identified with myself as more of like a anarchist uh sure. you know, liberal like not liberal but just anti-capitalist or whatever I don't even know where I where I sit at the time you know so I'm like figuring out who what the heck I'm, I like but I realize that it's not I safe or comfortable Republicans are calling themselves free spirits that's I think that's a simple way of putting it that's so, true yeah. that's a good point but the, the the scary part about it is like oh it, it wasn't really good to like Trump in the circle that I was a fan of, like everybody sure. that I, everybody that I associated with in the design community that I knew about that had a presence online or any of my friends that I made in the free spirit community in Austin, like 
it wasn't safe to even to say anything positive about Trump. Otherwise, you're going to be labeled like a Trump supporter, which was shameful and to be bad. And and I I mean, I'm like, I'm like, I'm not really a Trump supporter. I think he's a cartoon. But like, yeah, I kind of like how they're standing up for something that I feel like I need help with standing up for myself. Like I've been bullied by social justice activists and like controlled. And I feel like I didn't have I didn't have a voice of my own. It's like how good of a person can I be was like my identity. And, and it's so like I was controlled by the sense of being a good person. So this red pill era, this reclaiming my masculinity uh, era was like, I think that's, that's how I finished my Europe trip um, was discovering that reading books and um, trying to, and then when I got back to um, Ohio after this trip, like dating with this perspective that like, no, I matter too. Like as a man, I matter like, so it's built like my own self-esteem rather than like how good how good of a guy can I be more like what do I want and sort of getting in touch with my selfishness getting in touch with my lust my eroticism my carnal nature the my 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 power stuff that I just didn't feel like I liked or believed in because I didn't want to be like those abusive men sure exactly because I think I think and that's where even for other people, it can get confusing with all that, especially when you talk about, you know, a feminist point of view or a masculine point of view. And, you know, in today's day and age, it can be very triggering, triggering. But at least for me, what I hear is that it's like I'm getting in touch with myself as a human being. And if I'm trying to fill another agenda or go down this other path, um, it's like, I don't, I don't know if everybody has, but it sounds like a very familiar story where you kind of can get caught up in this thing and you're like, you come out of it and you're like, that was a weird year and a half where I don't even know if I 100% agree with all of this stuff that I was going down or going through. And it's mm -hmm. not really who I am and what I'm interested in. It's discovering yourself as a human being. Then you're going to tend to attract other human beings when you have your own self-confidence, whether male or female, even females will be coming up now. So it's not that it's a, uh, you know, some misogynistic point of view, all of a sudden where it's like, I was a feminist. Now I'm not at a, you know, here's a woman's place. It's, it's not any of that. It's your own mm. self-confidence. And then that's when you start attracting, Oh, these are more real interactions with human beings that I like, that I enjoy. Mm. Um, I'm learning to communicate with myself now I can communicate with other human beings better and it can become a much more honest relationship of, Hey, here's what I'm looking for in a relationship. But go, yeah, me too. Oh, great. And how great does that feel? Um, it is what it sounds like for me. Did you find any luck with that kind of right off the bat or were you, did you have a moment also almost like of, um, you know, a moment of peace, like the storm has kind of moved away and I'm going to sit here and enjoy the ocean uh, while I can and watch this sunset? Or was it one of those where you felt like as soon as you came out of it, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm so happy to be out of it. And it just clicked right away. You know, it started, it started at the end of Austin, you know, that time that I was like, why am I caring so much about women and what they think? What, when have I ever asked myself what I want and what I, what I want as a man or whatever. Sure. And so I met somebody that was like that supportive idea, of that idea into it. Um, but then I had my experiences in, in Europe that basically were like, I got to stop chasing women at all or even tr trying to because in the manosphere, it's 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 closely related to hookup culture, pickup artistry. It's very much tangential to pickup artistry. So I got into a lot of that material, too, because I was just fascinated. It's not like I wanted to. I was trying to build my own self-confidence with women instead of being a nice guy, you know, and I was, you know, trying to feel like, how do I how do I approach women or show that I'm sexually interested or show that I want something and without, you know, in a way that's confident and not creepy and to, 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 to withdraw my need from approval from these women and sort of act on my act, act with my own self-interest that doesn't feel bad or, or selfish or, 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 or mean or abusive or whatever manipulative. Yeah. It's but just moving from I'm, being, you know, a woman's best friend to being somebody that's desired in a relationship with women is what it sounds yeah. like. Yeah. And I mean, I had no, I, obviously I was married for, for, I was with somebody for 12 years and I never thought about male, female dynamics in that relationship at all, because I felt like I was with an equal, like I'm with my best friend, you know, but we didn't have sex like barely ever. So it's like we had, we didn't have a relationship like that. But so this, so this whole half, this whole era of my life was me trying to get in touch with the, the lower chakras of my personality, you know, from like 
from like the, the, the solar plexus down, like, who am I? <laughs> As like a, an animalistic uh, man, sort of like, this is where I got into shadow work rather than spirituality. So shadow work stuff is like, you're unconscious, you know, like Jungian projections, things things that you hate on other people are like dis disowned, un misunderstood aspects of yourself. And so I got heavily into shadow work as, as I apply this and the sort of like masculine aspect of my personality was definitely in shadow and related to my relationship with my father, all that kind of stuff. But where am I going with this? Um, <laughs> well, I think you're, pu you're pulling out as far as, uh, cause I had asked, um, you know, was, uh, how how hard did it hit you as far as once you had these realizations, say in Germany and you're feeling more comfortable with yourself, uh, you had talked about kind of maybe, you know, you had kind of identified with this group a little bit politically, but then went over here, but then felt almost like uh, a gap between those people, but you're, you're coming to find out who you are. And I'm curious then as far as the relationships, if mm. they came quickly, or if you were like, man, this feels good. I finally figure out uh, I feel like who I am and who I'm meant to be. And were those, you know, and I, I think in those situations, it's like right off the bat, I noticed that I was getting approached by women that I would much more like to be in a relationship with, or it's like, I took a breath and I had about six months to a year before I did anything. And then when I did go after it, I was able to find what I wanted very quickly. Okay. So I think, yeah, good question. And I think I have a good answer for that. So I, since I got into the pickup artistry stuff, because it was, it was fulfilling a need that I had of insecurity, like how do I approach it? So it was speaking to something that was supportive of me, but underneath all of it, it has a very manipulative tone. Like, so I was learning it with like this caveat that like, this wasn't exactly the full truth, but like, there's something in it for me. So I, I learned a lot of that stuff and I tried putting it into practice and I had some cringy experiences, um, but also some good experiences where like the women appreciated that I was upfront and straightforward and honest. And, and we had a great time. Like, sure. And I was yeah. like, Oh my God, I could just like be upfront and honest and not have to be like shy about what I want. And it's like, Oh my God, women appreciate that. They appreciate directness and honesty and assertiveness. So I was trying to establish more of that assertive, assertive personality. Now I still struggle with assertiveness and like, my, my shyness to this day. So it's like, I'm not fully healed or whatever, if, if there is ever a state, but sure. I think everybody does to a certain extent. Yeah. Yeah. But where I'm at now and how I got to this place, like, so like I met Kara in 2018 and she's, you know, she's the, my current partner and who, who I'm with now. And, but prior to meeting her, I had this like long, like period of time where I'm like, I'm not dating at all because what am I doing trying to, get into a, trying to like get into a relationship or, or m f like fuck around with girls and women. What am I doing? Like, it's a, it's completely like a waste of time. I started, it just started to feel like, um, why get involved with, with another human, you know, for like, for what, like to, to, to have some sort of, I, I want a deep connection. No, I wanted sexual intimacy. Maybe I already had enough experiences. Like how much is enough? You know, like and it's, it's, so it started to get to this point where it started to feel like a waste of time or like, I'm just using this girl. I don't want to use anybody. Like yeah. what am I doing? I don't need anybody. Why am I doing this? So I started to just swear off dating and kind of be celibate for a while. Uh, because they were it's like what would happen is like you get you get close to them and somebody gets upset so, so there's like you have to break up or have some sort of weird ghosting experience like or i get hurt or someone gets hurt it's like what are we doing fucking around with each other like two wounded people trying to figure out how to like heal each other's wounds it's like we're we're we trying to like fill each other's voids and the idea of like filling your own cup um was a concept that was new to me at that point. It's like, you can't really be healthy in a good relationship until you feel like you've filled your own cup. Like you can't go around using people to, for your emotional regulation, for your sexual satisfaction. Like, even if you're upfront and honest about it, which is what the pickup community is, they're like basically saying, yeah, you just have to be honest. Don't be, don't be a uh, duplicitous. Yeah. Don't tell them that you want a relationship when really you just want to sleep with them. Don't lie. Be, be straightforward but even now i was like okay i don't even know if i want this so it's all a complete waste of time so well and then um i i, I want to change gears here real quick too as we and i think that that's a that's yeah. an interesting point I'm, I'm curious now you've left go media you go on this road trip 
you make it over to Germany, you're back in Ohio. There's all of this stuff going on emotionally, personally, which I think that's the important part of the journey and the story, and it informs the rest of all of this and where we get to. So now I'm kind of curious throughout all of this, what what is work like for you? What is freelancing? Are you going back and forth? And because I know you mentioned before, you're like, maybe I'll be a professional cuddler. Um, and then Starseed starts up throughout all of this. Um, and then is that going well where you're like, oh, I'm making money off of this. So professionally, how are you doing? Is it a crazy roller coaster ride, just like your kind of personal side of your life as well? Um, are you having like big ups and downs and all that? And are you focused as much on what am I going to be doing professionally? Or did you have enough peace of mind to go through this personal journey without having to worry about work? How much of, of a factor is work throughout all of this? Well, work was fortunately not a factor at all, really, because of the, the way that I exited Go Media um, and the, the payment structure where they were able to buy back the shares of my ownership of Go Media enabled me to kind of float for five, six, seven years uh, with a consistent monthly income from that, that that basically paid for my bills and allowed me to travel. Like I didn't have much room for anything else. So like I had some still some passive income coming in from design products that I had designed uh, and and my books that I had written at the time. So I was making a little bit of money. And then I also started the Starseed Supply Co. Um, while I was in Austin. And that became like another income source. But like when I was traveling, I really couldn't fulfill orders. So I was having my mom do it while I was gone. I said, here's all That's my inventory. It. And I get a few orders a week. Can you ship them out for me? And she, you know, agreed. And she was happy to help me out with that. Um, so I was making enough money to not have to think about work. And actually, to be honest, work was the furthest thing from my, my gotcha. mind. I was like, I was like, I do not care about ambition. I do not care about making an impact on anybody. I, I do. So I was like, I cared only about like the truth. I cared about the truth of reality. Like, why are we here? What is the point of all of this? And um, truth, love, and freedom. That's when those three words became my mantra was during this whole experience. So professionally was able to take a little bit of a backseat then to that, which that has to, I guess in retrospect, are you pretty happy about that? Because I, I would imagine most people, that would be very refreshing that it's like, that was really nice that it was able to take a backseat um, for all of that. And do you think that that's yeah. had any impact now? Like one thing that I always worry about for me. And so even this time period right now of me not working is that if, and maybe even as I get older, this might be more of a human being thing, but you know, it's, it's one of those, you take a long vacation and in some ways you're looking forward to going back to work, but you've almost like completely forgotten how to work. And so for me right now, I sit a lot of times like terrified, like I haven't worked I haven't been working for, you know, a couple, for a while now and going back now, I'm like, oh no, I, I'm actually going to have to do this. I'm going to have to like go and put the yeah. hours in. It's becoming a reality where I'm like, all of that time off may not have, might not have helped me because I've gotten out of this habit. And now it comes back to the, the discussion that you and I have had where it's like, is that a good thing or a bad thing to have that much time off? Because do you really want to do that? Should you really be working? Are there other ways to kind of support all of this? So I'm curious when you look back on all that, are you happy that you've got to have all of that time off? Or, you know, do you, do you wish that you would have done more professional work throughout all of it? Hmm. I mean, I had a few freelance projects scattered about here and there, um, which I, which, you know, were helpful at the time. Um, but I am definitely happy about this. I feel so fortunate that I have been able to have this experience. <laughs> like, it's just as strange how it lined up like that. Like all of my ambition from growing up as a child led me to, uh, become a designer, join forces with Comedia and end up doing everything that we did together. Uh, starting WMC Fest, writing the books, you know, playing in these bands, basically like fulfilling all of my young, young teenage dreams, you know, as an artist. And then. And then like the leaving all of that and I was called by like something sparked in my heart, you know, the life's biggest questions journey. And I left all that behind and, and I was granted this like privilege of having like this 
monthly income to support me and I didn't have to work very much or at all. But the problem yeah. was I couldn't appreciate it as much during the time because I felt guilty. I felt bad. I felt like I was getting something that I didn't deserve. Like I felt bad because when I left Comedia, I, I felt like I put them in a worse position by me leaving and then they had to pay me. Yeah. Like, that's not what they think about when we sign up to become business partners. Sure. So I struggled with guilt. No matter what I did, I just felt like, like afraid that what am I going to do when this money runs out because I'm not motivated to work. I don't know how to do it. So even years, in, like I had years left that I knew I was going to be getting this, this regular recurring income. And fortunately, they were amazing with their consistency and the payments. They'd never, like, never missed a payment. And it was like so cut and dry. And I've even told them that I felt bad, but they basically were like, no, this is fine. We're, this is what we got to do. You know, we reached a fair agreement with lawyers and everything. So I, there was no real reason for me to feel guilty. I just think that I felt like I hurt them and put them in a bad position and it was my fault. And I was doing something selfish by like pursuing my own interests spiritually. And, and also like when I would talk about it online and I'm like, now I'm boasting about a spiritual enlightenment experience that I had. Now I'm talking about it. Like I'm selfish i'm um egotistical and and sure. even somebody somebody even criticized me when i did leave that i was egotistical and they were like happy to see me fail um oh, go, wow. go through this go through this experience they said maybe this will be your first maybe this will be your first downfall and i was like like you have no idea I, you know so i started to question myself am i just a selfish narcissist for for you know putting myself putting this like really important need that I feel like ahead. And I, so I never really felt comfortable with receiving the money because I wasn't actually working for it. Sure. Even well, though like technically I did work for it. It's just, it's been paid now. It, it really makes me wonder just because of parallels and maybe this is obvious or not, but you know, I, I know for me and maybe even human beings in general, not everybody, but th there does seem to be a parallel. And so I'm curious is that I, I can't remember um, if we talked about this or not. And so without going into, you know, too much detail or whatever you're comfortable with in, was there a parallel then there as well in the divorce that you blamed yourself a lot for all of that and felt yes. guilty? Yeah. I mean, it makes perfect sense. And that's why I think yeah. this whole like explanation of all of that makes sense is that it's like a lot of times our lives are reflected professionally as well, as far as where we're at, that it's like, of course, you're going to feel guilty about it. Look at what was going on uh, with uh, with everything else in life and all that, it's like, you know, that's, that's a big, big struggle. And of course, any decent human being is going to feel guilty about going through anything like that. It's just because we're decent people, but it's an interesting journey along the way. It doesn't necessarily make it any easier. I can look back on all of that and be okay with it as a more wise person. But if I had to go through with it again, still guilt, I mean, that's, you know, my journey right now of pursuing to try to get another job as much as none of us want to work is this the right path I should be on is that as soon as I lost my job, I felt guilty to my family that I'm like, I'm not mm -hmm. doing what I need to do for this family. I'm not, I, I don't feel good. I don't feel comfortable. And then um, if stuff personally starts to go that way as well, then I'm like, now I feel guilty that I'm not picking up the house every day and I'm not working and she is, and what am I doing? And how does this make me as a husband and a father that I think those parallels between professional and personal are really fascinating, which is why I think this, uh, you know, all of this is is great stuff for we should be working is that uh, it, it's it's a really remarkable, unique journey that I mm -hmm. think a lot of people can re reflect with and go through um, as well. So that yeah. being said, um, you got anything else you want to share before we? Uh, yeah, we yeah. Exactly. Yeah, like, go. I, do, I do think like the divorce and the betrayal that I experienced and sort of taking my own personal responsibility for it, like what could I have done differently to prevent this from happening was like a huge unconscious motivator for like why I pursued a lot of the stuff, like learning about why, why I know so much about relationships, why I know so much about the way men and women interact with each other. Like I've read so many books, listened to thousands of hours of podcasts and audiobooks, and attended workshops and seminars got into the read so many books on like 
you know, what women want and, 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 and how to please a woman and to make yes. her happy and to make her fulfilled and to make her valued and respected. It's like, if I could have just done that, then maybe this wouldn't have happened or something, yeah. you know? And, and I also could. it happened bad because I was selfish. I was working too much. I wasn't giving her enough attention. I wasn't empathetic enough to her problems and her struggles, even though I know, I, even though I was, because just like that's my natural inclination is to like want to talk and have communication and have conversations about feelings and, and what's really going on. So it's like I took personal responsibility because that's all I knew how to do. I couldn't blame her. And, and that's the way our that's why our divorce was so amicable. And like we we it was, the, the judge laughed at us when we walked up there and said we had nothing to separate. We had no no assets. She's like and we were both smiling as if we were like it was like our first date. We're like happy to take this divorce step. It was yes. very strange, but we're friends. And I was like, she's like, why are you mad at me? Like when she told me, I was like very forgiving. And it's because I've been practicing all these spiritual things leading up to it. Meditation, forgiveness, unconditional love, you know, all of that. And, and that's like my nature and my personality. But when it happens, it's like, I don't have a proper grieving response or an anger response. I didn't feel anger about this divorce or the betrayal until years later, really. And I started to understand oh, oh. like how women can manipulate men. It's not just always it's not the other way around. It's not always men manipulating women. Women do the same thing to men. We're all humans. We're all we all do this to each other. Exactly. You know. So the manosphere aspect was like, or the red pill was basically telling the truth about how, like, basically dispelling the sort of Disney-fied feminist lie about how men and women are supposed to relate and your role and 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 being sort of the people pleaser provider loving great resource not a threat at all to women at all you're supposed to do all of this for them so i think very much is related to guilt and to this sense of personal responsibility which i think is a major key part zach about like why we are obsessed with working and why we feel guilty when we're not working it's this like sense of ownership that we feel about ourselves and the people in our lives and, and how we take responsibility for that like if we are not doing it, we are the problem and we're hurting other people. Yeah. That's exactly how I feel. Is that oh, I must I'm the problem here, what happened? And you know, and then you get into a downward spiral. And the weird thing is is that even when you recognize, you know, it's like I think that about the first time that I was ever in a downward spiral, I was like, Oh, this is not good. And what is this territory? And it felt so brand new. And coming out of it, I'm like, it, you know, in some ways grateful that I'm like, I, that I went through that so that I could recognize that and go like, and um, I guess what I'm trying to say is appreciate that situation and when other people have described that so that when you go forward, you go, well, I don't want to be that. I don't want to be in that situation again. I want to do what I can to avoid that. And I feel like I developed steps or techniques to go through it. But inevitably, you'll probably go through it and the experience, it, it will be different. But even when you're in it again, you you can see that and go, I'm in the exact situation I was before. Here's how I felt about it. Here is how I went through it. And mm -hmm. while that still can help, it still doesn't change those feelings again. And you know that it's probably going to be all right. I've got to figure out a way through this. These feelings are not helping, but I'm still feeling it. How do I stop this? Um, mm. it's difficult to do because that's exactly what happened to me all over again is that I'm sitting there and I'm like, I'm never going to have a good job again. I'm never going to be appreciated professionally. This is the end of all of that. Uh, my, you know, and you, I can get to a really, really dark and deep path of, did I honestly believe this? No, but I'd be lying if I didn't say, you know, what if I don't do this? Uh, my family might be left dry, high and dry. I'm going to lose my house. My wife's going to leave me. My kids are going to think that I'm a failure. Like I said, was Wait. that overwhelming to me? No, I, I can easily do that, but it the thought definitely popped in my head. Well, what if that is true? Um, cause you know, I, tr I, I think one of my superpowers and I think like most superpowers, and we might've talked about this before, every superpower comes with a weakness is that I feel like I'm very, very good at seeing everything and considering every possibility out there. And the reason that I do that is in an effort to be prepared for any possible thing that will come out there, mm -hmm. but that's not always healthy because now you're considering and going down rabbit holes that are really detrimental to a positive state of mind and you know fortunately my wife really really is amazing at helping me out through these situations like i would say you know the first time that i ever lost my job um that was the first time that i was like oh my gosh she is 
really good at this. Like, I really suck at being unemployed. She is really good at being the wife of an unemployed man and understanding that situation as far as how I feel as a man that I'm supposed to take care of the family and I'm supposed to do this. Um, she did an amazing job of keeping me through all of that, keeping me positive, but also not in an emasculating way. Hmm. Uh, uh, that uh, I, I feel very, very comfortable, confident with her because I think like you've brought up as well, personally, you go through these situations um, with women or in relationships, you want to, you while you want to be known and understood, sometimes throughout those um, relationships, being open and honest can almost, you're worried that it's going to be emasculating to you, um, that you won't get to feel strong and powerful and all of this, that I'm telling you that I feel weak. I feel sad. I'm like, well, now they're not going to like me because I, I'm not a real man. I can't stand up for them. I can't provide for them. I can't chop down trees for them and fight off other men and all this because I'm being weak and exposing my feelings and all of that. Mm -hmm. And so it can definitely go that other way where you can feel very emasculated. And so for me professionally, um, sh she's amazing at that where I can still feel like a man and helpful to the family and a provider and uh, desired as well. And, um, and not feel like uh, this useless type of a worm guy that I, I kind of feel like at times that I'm not deserving of any of this type of stuff. So it, it was really fascinating. Yeah, man, I, I really feel you. And it's great that you've got um, such a supportive partner and it's scary to, to experience what you're going through because you're, you're used to people dismissing you or treating you poorly because of it. So it's like, wow, it's really refreshing to have somebody that's like helping you through it. And, you know, the, hopefully the pressure won't be there as much knowing that you're still safe, even if you fail or something, you know? Yeah, because I think that's the that's the illusion that has gone away, and I feel like in society today more than more than ever is back when we were raised, um, you would get a job and people would talk about careers, and people might even ask you, "Oh, how's your career?" as opposed to "How's your job?" Um, you would go down these paths, and you, we had these jobs that were careers. And people would stay in them for years and years and years. And I feel like in society more so, people are bouncing around from jobs more and more and more. But then again, now employers are also treating their employees much more like commodities than like jobs. And having a career path with one company is not nearly as guaranteed as it was. And so I'm still living in a reality where I'm like, hey, a big part of my identity can just be ripped away by a company at their own whim. Whenever they want to, somebody can go, eh, this isn't a part of how I want to run the group. My career is gone. My livelihood is gone. A lot of my identity is now just gone. Um, and what does that mean for where I am professionally? How do I feel about that? How do I get more control over my own destiny um, and not leave it in the hands of middle management uh, per se? Right. Uh, some SVP or some CEO that wants to restructure. Now, all of a sudden, you know, my family is upended. So uh, it, it's a weird path to try to go back into. So while I am grateful, I'm also very, very aware that I've got to find some, I don't know if I'd call it precaution, but some way of being okay professionally as well, knowing that I'm feeling good and stable with my family and we're taken care of without somebody else being able to rip that away from me, that I can protect that, um, trying to find ways to insulate that better. Yeah, you know, I hear that. And the, the interesting thing that I realized, it's like, even nothing, does everything, you know, we can do anything that we want, like creating a career, even a freelancer, like getting away from the nine to five, developing our own independent business, streams of income. It's still precarious, like, like a lot of freelancers in the self-employed creator economy, like are depending on the algorithm to like make sure their stuff gets, gets seen. And so now that they're not beholden to a company, they're by themselves, but they still feel the precarity of their income being pulled out from underneath them, them saying the wrong thing, them, them doing something that displeases YouTube or the social media monsters, or, or even the feeling force that you have to be on social media in order to keep your livelihood. So you still can feel safe because you still got a family and a house sure. and all that. 
And so the precarity of what they call platform labor you know, is becoming known. And the thing that comes along with it or that that's missing from the corporate life is a sense of community and coworkers and shared bonds and uh, stuff that you got in the nine to five that you don't have in like the platform world so much. So it's like it, when I felt into this, Zach, it, it's like the precarity of living here on earth generally. Like that's why we ultimately were afraid to lose shelter and lose like basic needs. But yes, exactly. Like what my experience has been basically becoming broke. Like, like over this past few years or past, well, few years as my income has just slowly come down to sure. where I'm basically broke. And I'm like, how am I going to pay next month's rent? Like I've felt into my own fear and craving for of survival. And it's like very primal. And what is actually important? It's like, do I have shelter? Do I have food? Do I have like somebody I can talk to? It's like, yes, I've got all that. Okay. That's all I need. Thank God. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, that doesn't cost hardly anything really. Yeah. Like, and so, oh. which, which is fascinating because like I said, I brought it up before where, you know, have going through this experience for me of losing my job and looking back through everything, you really do start looking around at what's necessary in your life and what is unnecessary. Yeah. And I quickly began to realize of how much unnecessariness if that is a word, probably not. But uh, how much <laughs> how much unnecessariness is around me? And you're right. Then that is that fight for okay. I need to fight to keep this shelter over my head. It's probably the I have it right now. This is going to be the easiest one for me to keep. Need to get back up. How do I keep that? Like you said, have somebody to talk to. How do I keep this family together? How do I keep all of us together? We're stronger together. Um, and then you do begin to realize that I'm like really don't need this lens really didn't need this light that I had to have like three years ago or something like that, or <laughs> didn't need to have, you know, this better monitor setup that I have, or this microphone, man, imagine what my life would be right now. If I didn't have all of these things, I would have more money and I could take care of this family better. And it always just comes back to then money again. It's all, it, it's that. And when you think about it, it's like having enough to, like you said, food, shelter, um, people that you love around you doesn't require as much money as most people realize. Um, and you can do it in a lot of ways, similar to like your Europe trip. There are ways and techniques to do all of this. And when you can accept that, uh, it can make a life a lot more uh, calm, I guess. Mm -hmm. when, when you're not chasing to keep up with the Joneses as far as like, oh no, like I, I need to find a... Like even now I'm struggling with this. I was like, I need to find a shelf in my garage so I can stack up all these boxes of stuff that I have. And I'm like, why am I so worried about this stuff that I have? This is crazy to me. So yeah. Yeah. It's a great way. Well, that, that, that leads me into like maybe the, the wrap up of this show, which is like what we're into this week. Um, because I have this, I have this experience where I'm like obsessed with redesigning my website right now learning the tools that I need to, to do to move forward and as, we, as a web designer. And I'm like, like literally obsessed. It feels like the most important thing, like you said, with the shelf, it's like, yeah. And then my body, my right arm was hurting so bad the other morning. Like I woke up my shoulder, like my rotator cuff or whatever is like totally fucked or something. I think I injured it like decades ago and like throwing a football or doing or lifting weights or something stupid. I don't even know what, but like, so it's like, and it was so painful. I couldn't even like really lift it. It's just sitting there in, in pain. And I'm like, okay, the right side of the brain is controlled by the left or the right side of the body is controlled by the left brain. The left brain is the logical masculine doing, if you want to just put it in groups like that. I feel like my, the right side of my body, I'm right-handed. It's like the doing muscle. I'm like obsessed with doing. I'm it's like my ego is, has this goal that it's fixated on and it won't stop until he completes it, until he's exhausted all the resources, all the knowledge. And I'm forgetting my body. I'm forgetting to eat. I'm forgetting to go to the bathroom. Yeah. I'm getting obsessed. And then so like this, my body's like, no, you are not working today. And I'm like, ah, but, but what am I going to do? I, I have to. And it's like, no, you are not. And so I took the, I took a couple of days off uh, because it was so painful. And I just had to nurse myself back to, back to health. I had to basically stop, stop moving, stop doing so much, Jeff. So life, there is a lot more to life that this problem of my website starts to become I put it in perspective. It's like, oh, it's not actually that important. I feel like it is, though. It feels like it's the most important thing, but 
Yeah. Yeah. It's uh no, that's a great place to uh to uh to wrap up there. So as we wrap up, um do you have any uh inspirations you want to go over for the week that uh made you feel uh well, I guess inspired? <laughs> um well, let's see. I mean I mean, I have been like to be honest. I have been inspired by the web development, web design stuff. There's there's some good resources there, but I sent an email newsletter to my audience uh, last week, and I got about about this, about my obsession with my web design project, and I I asked the question. I said, "Is this all marketing? Because why does like Webflow and these more modern web development tools like feel like they're taking the they're the future, but like." I don't know if I'm really, if it really is the future, if it's just marketing and these people that I'm looking at, these people are selling courses and they are slick. Their, their designs look futuristic and modern. They, they don't look old. They appeal to more of a Gen Z aesthetic. So it just looks like they're, you know, with anything with technology, you want to like stay up with the, tre the trends and the times and there's the whole AI thing. And so somebody replied to my newsletter and he's like, Hey man, I got one thing to say. It's all marketing. That's all it ever is. That's all it ever will be. There was something like that. Whoa. And I said, hey, I was like, you know what? I, he's like, but I'm a cynic, you know, so whatever. And I said, hey, you know what? I appreciate the cynical perspective. So if you've sure. got time, if you want to like elaborate, I feel free. So he wrote back and he was like, all right, stream of consciousness. Here we go. And he basically expressed how he's been in the game for a long time. He was in marketing for a long time. And he just like, he just sees everybody's selling something. Everybody's got a grift. Everybody's marketing themselves constantly. And it just makes him jaded and depressed. And I'm like, you know what? You're right. So that actually inspired me. And it, it's, it sort of made me take, a, give me a second look at like all of the content that I'm watching to try to teach myself web design and how much of it is driven by marketing and making me feel like I have skills that I don't have yet that I need to learn in order for me to make my website good to what, to, to make, to make sure that I make money off my website till I like put my best foot forward to look good. I don't know. It's made me question some of those things. Um, so then I was like, you know, what? I'm going to go out for a walk yesterday. So I went out for a walk, spent several hours out there in the woods, and it was nice not having any of the woodland creatures try to sell anything to me. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the, um, you know, it's interesting. I was talking with my wife recently about um, this guy that I just saw. There's, there's a lot of podcasts, video podcasts out there, channels that are – kind of just uh relaxing type stuff. Uh I've seen ones where people are mowing lawns um and millions of viewers. And they'll just he'll just film himself. Uh there's this guy and actually pretty well meaning goes out and will find like the worst yard that he can find while he's out driving and he owns a lawn care company and will go and offer to do that one for free and we'll just film it. He's like, let wow. me clean up this neighborhood. Let me go and do this. And we'll spend the day, I mean, someone, sometimes upwards of nine hours just cleaning up this yard and for free. Now, you could argue he's doing it for views. And sure, maybe he is. But really, at the same time, I think that that's a pretty good way. But I think people have related to that, that watching him do this task and seeing the transformation, there is something weird. Like, I, I, actually, I kind of enjoy watching, for whatever reason, this guy clean up yards. There was another guy that details cars um, and will film like him cleaning and detailing the car. I think maybe some of it is too. It's like seeing the cleanup people enjoy seeing chaos get turned into something organized or beautiful oh, yeah. or something dirty into something beautiful, that there's something in that and watching that process is kind of good. Plus sometimes it, it speaks to that little bit of a, Oh, that's so gross. And Oh, but you still watch it anyway, type of a thing. Um, the yeah. whole, like, you're watching a train wreck. Anyway, we were mm -hmm. talking about that type of an idea, and I was like, yeah, there's this guy. He's got five to six million viewers or maybe even more subscribers on his channel, and all he is is details cars. But then he started selling his car cleaning product. He came out with his own line of, like, car cleaner. And for me, I was saying, even though he's selling that, it was a very organic way to get to a sales where – in today's day and age, a lot of people, you to, to that guy's point, we are getting thrown a sale. And right off the bat, is like, buy this, buy this, buy this. And we're automatically turned off. And we're like, I don't want to do that. Versus you have a guy here that was like, well, I'm a detailer. Maybe I'll just set up a camera. People always say they love to see the cars afterwards. They see before and after. Why don't I just make a video? 
And then all of a sudden starts getting millions and millions of more subscribers and people are asking him, what are you using to clean this car? I want to use it on mine. I want to use it on mine. He's like, oh, well, maybe I should come out with my own cleaner. It comes out with it and people are like, oh, this is the greatest. This is the best. And now he has his own <laughs> line where it's a very natural way to a sale. So when you watch his channel, you don't feel like he's trying to pitch you his car cleaner. It's not what he is, what he's about. He still like just owns a detail shop at the end of the day. And um, so it's kind of a, trying to find those natural ways to a sale. Um, I think those are the channels that are the most successful is that again, to my wife's point, which she always says, she goes, everybody has their own voice and their way into finding their audience. It's just a matter of, can you get to them? Can you connect to them in the right way? The guy, Jack Conti from Patreon talks about it a little bit, but when we try to force it a lot and force the sale, that is going to turn people off right off the bat um, automatically. But I think that there are much more natural approaches. Hopefully people feel that way about this podcast. I'm not trying to sell you anything, but we do like having But we guys. will. We're yeah, on the we way will. to, de yeah. to <laughs> developing the thing we're going to sell. <laughs> yeah. um, as soon as you all want to buy it, we're going to sell it. Um, but yeah, so no, um, I, I, uh, I, I can appreciate that perspective and point of view. I'm glad that guy brought that up though. So, cause I, I mean, I feel like I've yeah. sold something every five seconds. So. Yeah. And it makes it so you can't really trust uh, something that you're watching. It's like, I'm watching this guy's uh, page builder one-on-one -on -one course and it's outstanding. It's like, I'm like, uh, I'm going back to, to design school and they're like, you know, it's, getting to the details of best practices of design. And I'm like, this guy's no bullshit. I like that. But he's also selling a CSS framework that, that uh, as you go through the course, you're, you're kind of learning how it's, how it's inconvenient. And then of course, at the end of it, he's like, you know what? I showed you how to do all this stuff the hard way Just skip all of this and uh, do it. I'll just have this, this framework for you to just buy from me. And I'm like, Ugh. like I find myself just, is everything going to cost a subscription? Like, God damn it. You know, why do I need another it's to $79 a year product? Exactly. Like, or I just learn how to do design web design myself and, and forget about the subscription. But yeah, but exactly. yeah, anyway, it's like, it wasn't like that. That's, this is the thing is like organic. Like you said, it was, uh, he was scrubbing cars, cleaning out detailing cars. And it was like, only then he started developing a product. He didn't start that way. And the same thing with this other guy, Flux Academy said, he started making, uh, web design tutorials or showing off. He did a vlog, a daily vlog, five days a week for two or three years without making any money until he got, uh, he went to a conference and did a workshop on Webflow and then Webflow sponsored him. And now he started making tutorials on how to do Webflow. Now he's got a $2 million a year business teaching Webflow. Like, but two, two or three years uh, doing vlogs, just showing people his life without any, like without any interaction, hardly. It's like, oh man, but yeah. Now it, when I watch his tutorials, I'm like, he just wants me to sign up for his course because every single video ends with him going, trying to do the course. It's like, yep. and then on, they, any, everybody got a fucking grift or can anybody? No, I don't know. And then so, they that's... sell out. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the thing is that, you know, there's, there's a company that I love and support, but they kind of went down that path as well, where they started off as, you know, a place of inspiration in the community um of design of trying to teach 3d design and they were pretty much the only ones out there doing it and it was really out of a passion for i love this and i just want to share this with everybody and want to make your life easier and now it's come down to a subscription-based model where you need to pay us so much money per year in order to learn and we've done this and it's all behind a paywall and it's like uh, it's now you're in for the cat. I don't feel that love for the community quite as much anymore. But the nice thing is, is that in my opinion, it kind of opens up for other people to now fill that space of, Hey, I'm going to now fill that void of, you know, being the one that you don't have to pay all this money for to be your mentor, to help uh, get you through all of this um, type of a thing. Cause while I think he was making enough money to sustain himself before, to me, and I think to some other people in the community, it felt like once they got a little taste for that money and they saw that, well, we're doing, you know, I have enough right here to, to your point, sustain myself, sustain my life, what I'm doing, how I go about this. But I'm being offered that I know that I can get way up here if I want to do this. And again, it comes back to what I said before in a podcast after reading Steve Jobs' book is that I was like, Look, becoming Steve Jobs and doing what he did is actually not nearly as difficult as I thought, but the sacrifice of the person that you have to become in order to do that, not okay with that. Most people are not. And so mm -hmm. it's like that little taste of money and greed 
just took just took over a little bit. Now you're like, oh, okay, yeah, and I'll leave originally what I was all about behind. And uh, and uh, now you got to pay me if you uh, if you want that mentorship. Which maybe yeah, that yeah. Man, you know, honestly, as much as that's a diss to them, I think that it, it is still a good company. They have a good product that people like, and all of that. And I think that they're decent human beings. I'm not saying that they're the bane of, you know, humanity or anything. I still use the product as well. So, um, as much as I don't like it, it's I'm still paying for it. So there you go. Yeah, and you're just touching on the whole, uh, uh, the big, large issue of us having to make money to live. You know, to just to to, sort of to live like no other creature on the planet has to to pay to live here. But you know, that's a whole other question. I mean, like, it's not like it's it's the the people making the products fault that they have that they're motivated by money. I mean, exactly, everybody is to some extent, and this it's hard to get around it i think we're in this phase of of like late stage capitalism where people are like well i'm going to follow my passion i'm going to do the youtube dream but then now they find themselves burned out that they can't stop being a content creator just like jack conti talked about and even with the patreon like everybody's got a patreon now so like everything that you listen to is going to become a cost of subscription and it's like it was authentic and meaningful and true and then it starts to morph into like a, a commodity of, of itself and then now the soul gets sucked out. Now it's an obligation to keep doing it to keep your lifestyle, and so that and then it eventually inshitifies, and then it collapses and dies, and then hopefully something new and authentic grows out of that. And um, you know, as far as teaching people, being a mentor for free, like there's this guy that I know that wrote this entire guide about healing IFS internal family systems work, trauma healing. He started writing notes in his obsidian document and he, and then uh, he started publishing it online. So it's like a labor of love. And eventually it's grown to several thousand pages. And it's like this guy's own like wiki of all of these healing modalities written in a way that is like the, the way that he wanted it written to him was like basically everything that you read online is overcomplicated or selling you something or requires a uh, you to pay an exorbitant fee to try to get the healing that you need when he says most of the people that need the healing aren't in the income bracket to be able to afford the stuff that everybody else gets access to and therapists have talked about this too where they're just like just treating the worried well the people that have the money that like are afraid or worried so then they're going to go pay someone to, to to help them with it anyway long story short i listened to a podcast with him and he talked about this as he was asked do you feel pressure to monetize it he says yeah I felt that early on how money changes things. It, it was a labor of love, but then I realized I was getting several thousand views a day on this website, and I thought that I could sell, start selling something. But I just feel conflicted with it. I can't do it. It diminishes the project, you know. Yeah, so. it's it's amazing how that stuff uh, changes things around. Um, anyway, any more inspirations? Anything else you want to share? No, that's about it for me. Perfect. Uh, the only thing I'll share is uh, I saw a fun movie. Uh, it was, uh, it was called Boy Kills World. Um, oh, interesting. Starring, uh, Bill Skarsgård. It was kind of, uh, this parody, just ridiculous action movie. And, you know, I, I wouldn't call it an overly gory movie, although it, there is, you know, some, some gore in there and all of that, but it's not like some gory horror movie. It's, it's a very, uh, uh, sarcastic action movie. Um, mm -hmm. It's like, uh, think about John Wick, if you had a, a sense of humor. And then, so some of the gore is for humor's sake um, as yeah. well. Like there's uh, one scene when he uses a cheese grater to attack some people. And you're like, oh, oh God. I'm not a cheese grater. But, you know, that's also ridiculous and funny type of a thing. Um, yeah. So that was a good, funny concept where it was, it was just nice to be able to go to the movie theater. Kind of reminded me of back in the 90s when go to the movies just have a good time no stress and uh and left it was it uh it reminded me of the good old days and so uh it uh i wouldn't necessarily call it a 10 but i mean it in the most positive way it was a uh a, a six to a seven in the greatest way possible that sometimes you just want a movie that doesn't make you think too much doesn't and just does the basics right has a good sense of humor has some fun writing a unique concept and uh, so I would recommend uh, if you're looking for a, if you're into action movies and uh, and a little bit of comedy, Boy Kills World is a uh, is a great one. And uh, it's made me That's think cool. about I hope that we can get back into that movie making of like 
hey, we can just make a comedy or we can just make an action movie. You know, Beverly Hills Cop, uh, you know, Die Hard, something like that. We could just come out and have a fun action movie or fun concept or comedies. Those movies are kind of dying, but I hope that they it, – It's in some ways I'm seeing it where maybe we might be able to start getting those back where we don't have to keep recycling IP over and over and over and over again. We can just kind of have hmm. fun one-off movies again. So that, that would – that's why. Yeah, that that's really cool, Zach. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to check that out. You know, hearing you say that, it reminds me, I did watch something this week that was actually really good. Uh, oh. It's called Baby Reindeer. You heard of that? Oh, uh, I haven't. Oh, my God. It's it's number one on Netflix this week. Oh, um, really? Okay. It's a it's like a, a limited series. Outstanding. Like, it's... Um, What's it people about? People are raving about it. Is it a series? It's, about, it's, it's a series. It's a series. Oh, okay. It's a based off of a real, a real story um, where a guy is being stalked by a woman and um, his experiences with it. And it's like, so it's like we tuned in because we thought it was going to be like another sort of Netflix true crime. Like, oh, we got a female stalker of this guy online and like it ruins his life. And, <laughs> you know, what's this? So it's like turn your brain off and watch it. But it's a drama, uh, not, a, not a documentary, but it's based off of a real story and based off and the, the guy who uh, experienced it directed and starred in this in, in it himself. Oh, gotcha. So cool. it's, it's off of his own okay. life. I mean, it delves into. Well, stalking, but it also delves into trauma and the nuanced nature. There's like no, there's good people and bad people, but everyone's kind of a blend in between. And it, it portrays like complex PTSD and, and, um, in a way that I've never seen depicted on screen. So like, it's, it's incredible. Like it's getting a lot of rave reviews and everybody's talking about it, but, uh, I, I definitely recommend checking it out. Perfect. Well, uh, we'll provide some links for people below. And um, everybody, thank you again for uh, tuning in. I know this was a long one, but honestly, it was one of my more favorite ones. We got into some really fun stuff there. So thanks for sticking with us. We would love it if you liked and subscribed. And uh, leave us a comment if you want to. We are getting some comments via email, which is uh, great, and we appreciate it. Uh, if you uh, don't have our email, feel free to comment below. We'd, uh, we'd love it. It means a lot to us. So uh, for the emails that we have gotten, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. It means the world to us, and uh, it was very awesome. So um, thanks, everybody, and uh, we'll see you next week. Bye. That's stupid. I'm not doing that.